Hi, I'm Tim. Welcome to Watchbox and thanks for logging on. This has been long in the making and highly anticipated. Possibly the most talked about watch of 2021. This is the new Zenith Chronomaster Sport. It's stainless steel, it's ceramic, it's very similar to a famous chronograph from Geneva. We're going to break down those similarities, talk about how it is its own watch, discuss fit a little bit, and then bring out some of the highlights of the product because every watch is able to shine on its own merits if appreciated properly. So basically it's rated as a 41, but my experience with the watch already is that it's closer to a 40. When I measure the bezel, which is the widest portion across the case, it's only 40.5 millimeters from bezel side to bezel side. So uh, the watch really does sit as a 40 millimeter on the wrist. You can see it's a little bit like a top hat. It projects beyond the case. So think of this as a 40 millimeter watch and you get the general idea. Now, one respect in which it is considerably larger than the Rolex Daytona, to which the comparisons will be inevitable, uh, but 13.8 millimeters thick. And I would say that's both the most distinct dimension and also this profile and three-quarter end-on isometric against the lugs. This is the look from which the watch is most distinctively Zenith. I think you can really see the Chronomaster case is very different from a Daytona when viewed end on. The Daytona lugs are much more tapered. They come to a point. Uh, the Chronomaster Sport has these sharply down-tucked lug profiles. And of course, the case itself here uh, is a little bit more sheer, whereas the Daytona case is a bit more rounded and narrow. You can also see that there's a transitional bevel that runs from end to end, and that is quite distinct from the Daytona. So th from these angles, profile and isometric end on, looking at the lugs, the watch really does feel exactly like a Zenith. Now, where it channels Rolex again is in the dimension. If you measure this lug to lug, it's 47 millimeters exactly, which is very close to a steel Daytona if you just measure it lug tip to lug tip. And if you were to measure the rigid outermost outcropping of the bracelet. It does have a pivoted end link, but the end link has a little bit of stiffness. Uh, you wind up with a watch that is 49.5 millimeters across the wrist, and a Daytona is going to be about one millimeter broader than that across the wrist. They also have the same lug spacing of 20 millimeters. So in terms of overall dimensions, it is very similar. That said, the watch does sit beautifully on the wrist. And I think this is where the watch is going to score a lot of points because it has a nice presence. Obviously, it's also low enough, though not nearly as thin as a Daytona. Daytona is typically about 12.2 to 12.4 millimeters thick. This is 13.8. is a little bit chunkier, but we're not talking Ublo chunky. And you do get an awful lot of value for your thickness with the striking tenth, the extended power reserve, and of course, the automatic winding with a solid stop seconds function is never originally included on the El Primero. Plus, you get a display case back. There's a lot of functionality in this watch, and I think it's worth the extra thickness. Let's take a quick look down the barrel, because this is kind of important. Uh, you can see this watch comes nowhere near the edge of my wrist. The watch looks most original on the optional Kodora effect strap, and I think on the strap, you could probably wear this watch on a wrist as small as 13 and a half centimeters circumference, even though it's a 41 rated, and, and that is also similar to the Rolex Daytona, which wears well on a wrist of that size. You can see from over the top, it actually looks a lot bigger than it, it is. Uh, one thing about this watch is that proportionally, it seems to be more dial and bezel, whereas the Daytona shows a little bit more of the lugs from the top. Uh, this watch is much broader and the dial and the bezel, because both are black on this version, they sort of run together into one enormous dark disc that dominates the head-on shot. And I think this version of the watch looks more distinctively Zenith, whereas the one with the white dial winds up looking a little bit more like a Daytona because of the contrast, because it doesn't, it doesn't read as an enormous disc of monotone material. Uh, taking a quick look at the cuff shot one more time, you can see you're probably fine for a dress cuff, but jackets for absolute confidence and cuff clearance. The bracelet does look like that famous three link known as the Oyster. I will say this though, uh, one change Zenith made, actually two changes that, that I like a lot, are the transitional bevel down the flank of the links. And you can see that's something that you don't really get on a Rolex. Uh, whose oyster links are very squared off on the sides. They're very squared off from top to side. And then I also like the fact that larger 
gaps were opened between the links because this vents better than a Rolex Oyster. I've often said the new Jubilees are actually better sports watch bracelets than the Oysters. Uh, this will vent as well as a Jubilee, and that is the reason I like the Jubilee because it's not going to pinch skin, pull hair, or trap wrist heat, and this watch is constructed in the same fashion. Though, again, with this particular design, the references are going to be inevitable. I think the place where the watch looks most like a Rolex is, frankly, the clasp. And the clasp design, as you could see, is very similar to that famous Geneva Chrome. Chronograph. But I'll also say that the construction is more similar to a Rolex clasp from the 90s, which, hey, not to the El Primero era, uh, but I, I mean that in the sense that the clasp itself is of a slightly thinner gauge. It's nicely made, though. It's polished on the side, and it does have that transitional bevel from the link, but you can see that the adjustments here are going to be made by a divot-based system, and unlike the Rolex divots, which are, are inside the clasp and invisible from the outside, these are punched straight through, uh, which makes it a little bit easier to use your strap tool to change the anchoring point of the bracelet, but it also does look a little bit more uh, like a 90s clasp and like maybe a previous era of clasp refinement. The visible divots externally make the refitting of the bracelet inside the clasp easier, but again, I do think it makes it look like a somewhat earlier era of bracelet construction. Uh, you can also see that there is a, a clamshell system that locks much like the Rolex clasp, but it does not have that internal beacon hook secondary locking system. That said, it is very solid, redoubtable, comfortable, and infinitely preferable to some sort of a friction fit system. You can also see that the pivoted clamshell lock is fixed by a screw, which is a luxurious way of building that kind of mechanism and bodes well for future maintenance requirements. If you need maintenance, it'll be easier to replace that component if it gets damaged. Rolling back to the case again, uh, just in terms of the lines of the case, from these angles, it, the watch is all Zenith and very similar to previous Chronomaster designs. So absolutely no objections there. This is where the watch is most distinctively Laloque rather than Geneva. We've got pump style pushers over on the crown side, of course. Uh, pump style pushers, maybe you could compare it to a 60s or 70s Daytona, but not really to a modern era screw down crown. So again, the case band is where this watch really shows its Zenith identity most clearly. Uh, also on the specific calibration of the bezel, as you can see, the bezel is a one tenth of a second calibration. Now, early versions of the striking 10th would try to lay this calibration out on the dial or in a Ray Hot chapter ring inboard, which would create a little bit more of a crowded dial. I'm happy to see the ceramic bezel here because it does help to shield the watch from scratches and also because it makes it easier to read those tenths of a second. The idea of the striking tenth, which first was showcased back in 2010 by Zenith, is that you take that one tenth of a second resolution of the El Primero, which beats at 10 times per second, 36,000 vibrations per hour, and what can be almost impossible to read on a conventional second scale becomes easier as we draw out these seconds to cover larger angular sweeps of the dial. Uh, so you can see in the time that it takes for four seconds to elapse, the needle is going to travel from 12 o'clock down to the station 04. And so it's a lot easier to read these little hash marks and discern the fractions of a second when you have a bigger physical space over which to judge the scale. Now let's reactivate the system. And you can see that one of the sacrifices of the striking tenth is that you do lose a chronograph hours display. So you have your constant seconds, your chronograph seconds, and then you have your chronograph minutes. And I'm happy to see 60 minutes, because a 60-minute chronograph register is really ideal for practical everyday use, and a lot of folks wish they had a register that went beyond 30 minutes. So this is actually handier to me than if there were an hour scale. A few changes here. Pull the crown out all the way. Now we have hacking seconds. Previously, every El Primero save the day file El Primero 21, which was only half an El Primero mechanically. Uh, El Primero's never had hacking seconds. They didn't have it in the Rolex era. They didn't have it in any version of the Zenith Caliber 400, uh, but you have that now. Another change here is that the intermediate position, which on an El Primero sets the time, here, it, it operates the quick set. So normally on a standard El Primero, you pull the crown out all the way and that's where you operate the quick set. That has been reversed. It's more like a conventional watch, and dare I say a little bit more like a Rolex, but Rolex Daytonas don't have a date. So on that front, advantage Zenith. I also like the fact that a black date disc was used here with white on black printing. It makes it easier to read. Now the tri registers with a little bit of overlap. That's a nice tie to Zenith design heritage. And of course, that's one of the areas of the watch where it's mostly distinctively a Zenith product. Rolex wouldn't do overlapping registers and Rolex wouldn't do a tritone. So right there, it does feel more like a Zenith product. And of course, the indices themselves here are all applique, diamond polished and rhodium plated as are the hands at center.
We're going to flip the script and flip the movement. We asked for decades for a second generation El Primero, and the El Primero soldiered on a great movement, but there was clearly room for improvement. And here with the caliber 3600, which first debuted back in 2019, the 50th anniversary of the El Primero, we really have everything we could have asked for. We have that striking tenth system for reading one tenth of a second. We get the hacking seconds. We get an extra... 10 hours of power reserve. It's now 60 hours of power reserve. We still have a column wheel lateral clutch system, and the column wheel is as crisp as ever. It's a real pleasure to actuate, and I would even say that here, uh, Zenith remains neck and neck with Rolex, Longa, and maybe even the Breitling B01 for best chronograph pusher fuel in the business. It still beats way at... 360,000 vibrations per hour. You can see Etacron is now used for fine adjustment and regulation, which I really like because that allows for a very precise dialing in of the timing of the watch. And if you want utmost precision, uh, you want Etacron. Now, I would also mention, though you can't see it, there's a silicon escapement that's unlubricated that increases the precision as well as the power reserve, as well as the intervals between service. So I'm really happy to see that right there. Um, still lateral clutch with the column wheel. I like lateral clutch chronos because you can see the lateral clutch under my finger. It's beautiful, it's visible, it's very traditional, and I think it gives you a better aesthetic impact from the reverse side. All of this is 100 meters water resistant. Again, similar to Rolex, but it's done, as you'll note, without a screw down crown. It's a 35 joule movement. And you can see Zenith gives you something Rolex doesn't, a little kerf underneath the crown so you can dig in your nail and pop out the crown. And I really like that. That is a wonderful refinement uh, that I find just absolutely dreamy if you happen to be like me, manicuring your nails constantly for close-up video shots. So score, Zenith. I like this watch. This is a watch that will establish its own identity in time. I think there was some initial shock seeing the watch, especially from this angle or this angle or this angle online, and there is no question that Zenith has drawn styling elements from Rolex, and Zenith has done that for a long time. For decades, they've borrowed styling elements from other successful brands. Zenith is and has always been about the movement, and this watch continues that tradition. An upgraded El Primero, a handsome case, a practical set of features, a well-made watch, and unlike a certain Geneva chronograph, this is a watch that you will be able to buy with minimal weight in the near future. So I like where this is going. Guys, let me know what you think in the comments below. Time out, Tim out, Zenith out, and thanks for logging on. We're back with the Chronomaster Sport. You can see the loom at night, very bright, super luminova, but this is actually where it looks nothing like a Daytona, neither in color nor in layout. Very Zenith.